When we were kids, we loved to outdo each other. I got a better grade than you did on the test, or my dog's tougher than your dog, or I can beat you in a race anytime. Now we're adults and we don't do such things, right? <laughs> well, that's not quite right. And in the world of diabetes and its cure, we often get into arguments over whether the plant-based diet or the keto diet is best. Sometimes we act like we're in a poker game. Listen to this latest study, Meat Causes Cancer. Oh yeah? Well, I'll see your study and I'll raise you two studies. High-carb diets raise triglycerides and lower HDL. So many studies with so many seemingly contrary conclusions. What's a person to believe? Last week, I talked about Nina Teichel's book, The Big Fat Surprise. In this video, I want to lift a few more quotes from her book and look at the issue of studies and trials which deal with the subject of the low-fat, plant-based versus the low-carb, high-fat diet. But before we get directly into that question, I want to look at the question of studies in general. And the first thing I need to say is that not all studies are equally valid. In fact, some studies are essentially useless. Let me give you a couple of examples of how this works. Let's suppose I get about a thousand people to answer my questionnaire, which asks two questions. First, how many hot dogs do you eat per week? And second, how many times have you been in the hospital in the last five years? After I organize my data carefully, I find 50 people who eat four or more hot dogs every week and 50 people who answered that they eat no hot dogs at all in a week. When I look at their answers to the other question, how many times have they been in the hospital in the last five years, I find what seems to be a highly significant correlation. The people who ate four or more hot dogs per week have been to the hospital an average of five times in the last five years. But the people who answered that they ate no hot dogs in a week declared that they had only been in the hospital an average of 0.2 times in the last five years. Eureka, I shout. I have found the answer as to why America is so sick. It's hot dogs, baby. They're behind the cancer. They're behind the diabetes. They're behind the pneumonia and the gout and the high blood pressure and every other health problem. Now I'm ready. I go on a crusade to wipe out hot dogs from America's diet. I get my own YouTube channel, which I title Swear Off Hot Dogs Forever. I go around the country making anti-hot dog speeches, and I gather like-minded groups of people in the town squares all over America to burn hot dogs as a protest. I'm totally convinced that I'm right in this. After all, the statistics of my survey proved it, didn't they? <laughs> well, actually, they didn't. They didn't even come close. And the reason is because of what researchers call confounding factors. The problem is, people who eat hot dogs four or more times per week would almost surely tend to be totally unconcerned with their health. They would likely be overweight, most would never exercise, they would eat candy and sugar treats like crazy, and well, I could go on and on. And since all I did was to take a quick two-question survey, it would be impossible to say it was the hot dogs alone that caused them to go to the hospital more often, and all the other factors don't mean anything. The truth is, my survey, my little research project, and my wipe out the hot dogs campaign would be what really means nothing at all. Studies that are based upon surveys, questionnaires, or simply look at groups of people and their health without using control groups and strictly isolating variables are worthless. Or let's take a look at another version of this. Some people have said, well, Seventh-day Adventists don't eat meat, and yet they have a much higher rate of health, much less heart disease, and much less diabetes than the general population of America. Therefore, it must be the problem with America's health is that we do eat meat. If we can just imitate the Seventh-day Adventists and skip the meat, we'll be as healthy as they are. Once again, the problem is the huge issue of confounding factors. Seventh-day Adventists, as a whole, do a whole lot more than simply leave off the meat. They work hard, they're self-controlled, very religious, they think gluttony is a sin, they avoid a lot of sugar, and, well, I could go on and on. To simply isolate their avoiding meat and draw the firm conclusion that meat and meat alone is why they're healthier than most Americans is both illogical 
And to be honest, it's just plain stupid. So why bring this up? Because many of the so-called studies that people throw at each other these days are not randomized controlled trials. These are survey studies and observational studies, and they prove exactly nothing. And as far as I can see, it is the low-carb and the keto guys who are far more into the idea of randomized controlled studies, which totally isolate variables, than the plant-based folks are. The plant-based folks love to talk about ancient China or Japan and say, you see, they ate rice and they were healthy. Ergo, rice makes you healthy. But that proves nothing at all. They don't mention that these people were also skinny, they ate tiny portions of rice and nearly every other food they ate, they worked hard, and they ate very little sugary foods. Another issue that makes studies useless is just to use a handful of participants. You cannot try to make a world-class assumption on a study that involves 32 people. Anybody who does that is clearly desperate to try to make their case. When I was in school, one of my teachers used to like to say, figures don't lie, but liars figure. Of course, what he meant was that if you want to, you can take statistics and manipulate them and make them pretty well say whatever you want them to say if you work at it a little bit. Now, I'm not quite that cynical. I don't accuse most of the researchers of being liars, but I am convinced that many of them were and are biased, and not just barely biased or slightly biased, but enormously biased, biased to the max. And some of the doctors who talk about diabetes today are surely biased. For example, if you love animals so much that you consider the killing and eating of a cow to be a terrible crime and a horrible thing, then the last thing in the world you would want would be for a diet with meat in it to prove to be healthy for us and good for us. You will snatch up the tiniest, the most obscure, the most poorly done studies you can lay your hands on to prove that eating meat is bad, bad, bad for you. Now, the very best studies are going to be what we know as randomized controlled trials based on large numbers of people and lasting for several years. And in the area of low-fat versus low-carb diets, there is one such study that trumps all the others. It is the biggest, the costliest, and the longest of any other study of its kind that I'm aware of. It is called the Women's Health Initiative, and it was done in the absolute heyday of the low-fat movement. Nearly all those involved with the study expected this would be the final nail in the low-carb coffin. This would prove once and for all that the low-fat, low-calorie diet with its emphasis upon fruits and vegetables would prove vastly superior to every other diet and would fix all our problems. It was begun in 1993 and it lasted for nine years and it cost about $750 million. This was, at least up to that point, the mother of all dietary studies. Tens of thousands of women were divided into either the low-fat group or the control group, the ones that simply ate the standard American diet. Nina Teicholz writes this, More than 20,000 women in the low-fat diet group were instructed to cut back on meat, eggs, butter, cream, salad dressings, and other fatty foods. Women were urged to eat more fruits, vegetables, and whole grains. This is basically the same low-fat, mostly plant-based diet that the American Heart Association and the USDA recommend today. These women were monitored closely for nearly a decade. After all this time, the results were horrifying to all those expecting to see the popular low-fat diet glorified. Nina writes, after a decade of following the low-fat diet, they were no less likely than a control group to contract breast cancer, ovarian cancer, endometrial cancer, stroke, or even heart disease. They had, on average, lost only one pound more than those who ate whatever they pleased. Robert Thun, a director of research at the American Cancer Society, told the New York Times, the results for cancer and heart disease were completely null. Now, strangely, it didn't change many minds. The high-carb, low-fat, low-calorie experts were determined to believe what they wanted to believe, and they simply said very little about it. They figured the study must be flawed in some way or another, but just how it was flawed, they really couldn't say. In Jason Fung's book, The Diabetes Code, he also discusses this study. Fung writes, The women followed this low-fat, calorie-reduced diet for more than eight years, 
Yet the rates of heart disease and stroke did not improve whatsoever. There were absolutely no tangible benefits to a long-term compliance with a low-fat diet. Despite 40 years of research trying to link dietary fat, dietary cholesterol, and heart disease, not a single shred of evidence could be found. The low-fat, calorie-reduced diet was a bust. Well, let me conclude by saying that we each have to do our own homework, make our choices, and live with the consequences. But one thing you do need to know, when one of the low-fat gurus gives a speech and cites studies and research which suggests that you'd have to be an absolute fool not to go low-fat, high-carb, and that there are no credible studies that suggest otherwise, well, he's simply not giving you the whole picture. Not at all. Again, figures don't lie, but biased people figure and study and research and handpick those studies that suggest they're right and totally ignore the studies that say they are dead wrong. Okay, well, that's about it. It's not my job to convince you of anything except for the fact that the struggle against diabetes is winnable and that whichever way you go, you're almost surely going to have to restrict your carbs. Choose your weapons, choose your diet, and may God bless you and give you the victory. As always, if you found this video helpful, give it a thumbs up. YouTube will see that and promote it to more diabetics who are looking for answers. And consider subscribing to this channel and click that bell icon so you'll be notified every time we post a new video. God bless. See you again soon.